It is Friday, July 8th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, everyone, welcome back. We've got a very exciting week, of course, for very obvious reasons, but uh, before we get into that, let's start, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. Those July PS Plus Essential games are now live, so go ahead and grab those. It's Crash Boards About Time, Arcadegeddon, and also the Dark Pictures Anthology, The Man of Medan. Those games are live on PSN. Go grab them. For our first story, though, let's talk about PS5's recent system software update. This one is 22.0105.50. And it actually includes a kind of a big fix for a problem that was introduced back in April with that last major PS5 update. And uh, ironically, this update is also not mandatory, so you can push it manually if you want to. But this was a problem that was kind of big, but it only affected a small group of users uh, if you own a newer television that has, you know, things like VRR or also a auto low latency mode, where PS5 also now had that feature. And what it was doing inadvertently was automatically changing the uh, your TV settings to that game mode setting and uh, utilizing auto low latency mode, which is a good thing, but you know, there is the chance that you may want to use certain TV settings or picture settings that you want to adjust and toggle, and PS5 was more or less blocking this depending on the TV model that you had. So certain TVs you could get around this, other ones you couldn't, and that was the problem is that Sony did not have any sort of ALLM toggle directly on PS5. And uh, well, this update finally uh, includes that. So if you download this update, install, it's in your video settings where you can toggle ALLM off or on. And if you toggle it off, it'll only go on during VRR output. So it'll pretty much, um, you know, it'll only do that, but if you set it to automatic, it'll it'll function like it was previously. Uh, good to see that this was finally addressed. Uh, took a little bit there, and again, it didn't affect a lot of people, but with more time and more people upgrading their TVs, more people were bound to run into this eventually, so good to see that it was finally addressed. Moving on to our next news story, if you remember not too long ago, Sony used to offer buying TV shows and movies directly on PSN as in not from other providers, but from Sony themselves. You could buy, rent, and watch TV shows, movies on a PS3, 4, and uh, even a PS5 where you can access you know, previously purchased content because they did cut this initiative off a while ago, so they don't do new releases, but um, you could still rewatch what you bought before. Uh, however, a new notice recently was put out for customers in Germany and Austria where if you bought certain content items from the French distribution company Studio Canal, they're now taking down a decent amount of movies as of August 31st and they're being removed from your video library. Doesn't matter if you pay for them, they're being taken down due to license agreements. So uh, presumably the license is up and Sony's not going to renew it for what is an initiative that they no longer do. So. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's the problem with digital ownership, and uh, at least in the context of this situation where it's uh, the kind of stuff you can buy outright or what you could do previously, um, TV shows, movies, you know, these licenses are typically long-term, as in decades for all these different services, so... Um, not to say that this is going to happen you know more frequently but it wouldn't surprise me if in the next five to 15 years we see you know more news stories like this where you know certain tv shows and movies from certain distribution companies on psn uh if those licenses are up then they're going to be gone completely so you might want to be mindful of that if you bought a lot of that stuff on psn back in the day next up patch 1.17 is live for horizon forbidden west and like most other patches there is some fixes, improvements, but this is also the patch that includes a high frame rate VRR mode and also the uh, much coveted 40 FPS mode that we've seen from games like Ratchet, Spider-Man, and uh, we knew this was coming. It's finally here for Horizon, and uh, this will be a balanced mode between having a slightly higher frame rate uh, capped at 40, where it divides evenly into TV sets that can offer 120, uh, but also offering a very sharp image quality with a, a higher resolution target, and uh, that might just be one of the best ways to play this game, despite the fact that the performance mode was recently fixed in a pretty massive way where that was the problem for a bit uh, with the shimmering issue and the uh, you know less than perfect uh, visual quality and reduction resolution in that performance mode. It was actually something where for me, and I don't mind playing at 30, I really don't despite how many 
console games nowadays finally offer 60. It's great, but I don't mind going to 30. And so for Horizon, I actually played most of that in uh, most of that in Fidelity because the game just looked so much noticeably sharper in that setting uh, in particular. But uh, yeah, I think for my new game plus, it's definitely going to be that 40 hertz mode. It's a really great balance between, again, a slightly higher frame rate, a little bit smoother for the gameplay experience, but also having uh, such a visual spectacle like Horizon really able to display and show off its true colors with that uh, crisp image and exploring that world. It's just, it's incredible. So uh, yeah, great to see that this is finally here. Now, of course, the big news this week was the confirmation of God of War Ragnarok's uh, release date, which has been a debacle for the past two weeks where, you know, initially it sounded like, oh, okay, maybe it's a, a new trailer, a state of play or something. Then towards the very end, it's like, oh no, actually it's just the release date, pre-orders and collector's edition uh, details, which, um, you know, at that point, uh, we also learned that the game might have been moved internally from September to November. And uh, all that was largely true, just it didn't happen on June 30th, happened a few days later, but all confirmed, the game's coming out November 9th, 2022. This year, very exciting. They also put out a new CG trailer. Looks very nice. Not gameplay, of course, but still um, gets me uh, pretty excited. And, uh, well, of course, they did outline the pre-order and... Um, collector's edition info so let's go over that there's a lot to uh, look at here so uh, as you would expect there is a launch edition that includes the kratos risen snow armor and atreus risen snow tunic which for that it says it's cosmetic only so this is more speculation on my part but that might imply he's not playable as some are you know theorizing but there's that also confirmed, the PS4 to PS5 upgrade is $10, which Sony has outlined before, so we were expecting that, but at least it's good to see that it is confirmed and they're consistent. For the digital deluxe version, that includes both the PS4 and PS5 versions, you get the Kratos Darkdale armor, the Atreus Darkdale attire, Darkdale uh, blades handles for the Blades of Chaos, the Darkdale axe grip for the Leviathan axe, the soundtrack, digital art book, the avatar set, and a PS4 theme. For the Collector's Edition and Jotnar Editions, these were unboxed in detail by Thor's actor, Ryan Hurst, and also Raf Grissetti of Santa Monica Studio, the art director. And both editions come with all the digital goods that we just outlined, including a code for both the PS4 and PS5 versions. So both editions come with a blank steelbook, no actual disc, so again, just a code for PS4, PS5. Um, but the Collector's Edition has a Dwarven die set, a 2-inch Veneer Twins carvings, and a 16-inch Mjolnir replica. And the Jotnar edition has a different colored die set, the carvings, the Mjolnir replica, but it also has a Falcon, Bear, and Wolf pen set, the legendary drop near ring, the Yggdrasil cloth map, and a 7-inch vinyl record. Now, there's no actual pricing that was announced for all these editions, but pre-orders do go live July 15th, 10 a.m. local time. So they're giving ample notice for uh, people trying to get a pre-order in on these higher editions where, uh, like the Firefly edition for The Last of Us, that went out pretty quickly. So um, and in terms of pricing, we're looking at, what, $150, $200 for those higher editions. And I, I don't think there would be a massive price difference between uh, the Collector's and Jotnar edition. But for the most part, you're going to be dropping a lot of cash anyway. Anyway, um, and yeah, it is strange that we're seeing again no uh, actual disc for these uh, for the higher editions uh, like like Horizon Forbidden West. But um, you know, one good point that somebody brought up a while ago, and I'm I'm seeing others say it as well. But it's like if you have a digital edition PS5, then you would never have the opportunity to buy you know a collector's edition of the game and not have to double dip and have a disc that you don't want or whatever. So that certainly makes sense. Although I wish it did still have a disc but um that makes sense and also some people just like having steelbooks with or without a disc like nowadays they're becoming very popular where you could even buy the steelbook separately for ten dollars so they're not really for me but hey steelbook collectors um you've got an option here so that's good and uh you know all around it's just uh there's so much positive energy and hype surrounding this game so much so that uh, that's a good segue to our next news story because the social media engagement for this game is nuts. And 
mind you, we're only talking about a release date announcement, right? That was the whole controversy and debacle uh, from last week where there was so much, you know, fan pressure in a really weird way just off of, you know, more info and a release date announcement. Um, but the engagement is so high. So for that cinematic trailer, as of right now, it's at 3.7 million views on YouTube. The unboxing video is at 1.6 million. The uh, release date announcement on Instagram has 1 million likes. Over on Twitter, it's 150,000 on Sony's tweet. Uh, Santa Monica's post has about 90K. It's just, uh, I mean, these are, there's higher metrics out there, but for you know a single game and just the release date announcement it's wild you know everyone's so excited and for good reason um you know the 2018 game is so impactful and so uh revered so there's a lot of pressure on this game coming up but at the very least we know we've only got four four or so months to go right and that also means we should be seeing more info on the game uh very soon now, on the flip side of that, for the PS5 timed exclusive, Forspoken, this game was delayed again out of October into January of next year. So, over on the game's official Twitter account, they say, and I quote here, As a result of ongoing discussions with key partners, we have made the strategic decision to move the launch date of Forspoken to January 24th, 2023. All game elements are now complete, and development is in its final polishing phase. So, that to me sounds like this game could have hit October as planned if they really wanted to, but uh, with key partners, which, you know, Sony is a key partner here, it just, it sounds like, you know, both parties came to an agreement that it might be best to move this game out of uh, that quarter where it was looking very busy with some heavy hitters from other publishers. Uh, Sony themselves and also Square themselves it just there was a lot going on there and you know Forspoken is a new IP and there's already some skepticism surrounding it I think this game needs some breathing room so this sounds very appropriate to me uh, put it you know right after the holiday season um, and it might be a, it might have a better chance to command some conversation and uh, assuming the game you know lands and resonates uh, and reviews well maybe it will actually have a uh, you know a fighting chance Next up, this is more of a PSA than anything else, but if you haven't just yet, make sure you download The Matrix Awakens, the Unreal Engine 5 experience on PS5 before it goes away tomorrow, July 9th. It's being delisted, so if you haven't just yet, make sure you download it at the very least so it's on your account because you can re-download it. Uh, that's confirmed, but you might want to make sure it's just uh, downloaded ahead of time. It's a very cool visual uh, spectacle next-gen showcase where it's got an on-rails uh, shootout experience, and that looks uh, just mind-blowingly nutty. And then after that, it opens up into this uh, huge environment where you can walk around, uh, drive cars and that's also pretty cool. It's a very experimental and it's more of a showcase than anything else But um, you want to make sure you have this before it goes away completely So if you haven't just yet make sure you download it Moving on to our next news story. We have a rumored PlayStation event coming possibly next month uh, some kind of state of play or, or something uh, now I'm really happy actually that nowadays uh, most people from what I'm reading and seeing online that they're getting sick of these rumors right because they happen very frequently where oh there's another playstation event next month next month next month and eventually it's right uh but i hope that if you watch this channel you know we don't really do that here i tend to ignore a lot of those um otherwise we would have that news story every other week which there's no point that's very misleading so if it's a rumor i try to bring it up when there is something backing it you know two or three different sources or somebody that's been reliable or a reporter or, or something right and so for this that's kind of what's going on here it's from the uh, reset era user ashong which we mentioned uh, very recently for the whole god of war thing which if you remember they had actually put out um before jason schreier's report came out that internally god of war went from uh, September to what most were assuming was October or November. They said it was an internal delay, but still coming out this year. Uh, and then we had uh, Jason's report come out that it was from September to November. And of course, the confirmation that God of War is in November. Now, obviously, Sony didn't come out and say that, yeah, we were doing September, so now it's November for more, you know, redundancy on this user, but they were also uh, vetted through recent era, like last year or something. So, 
apparently they you know have info of some kind from sony so the point is recently on recent era in the ps studios thread they had posted this emoji that is a calendar and depending on the device that you're viewing it on you might not be able to see what they were trying to get across but um they clarified that uh they said well that ruins the fun the original post said july event and the emoji i posted had a curl at the bottom which meant to turn the page expect something in august basically there could very well be the release date or whatever before then though this is a uh, in context context of a God of War release date. Um, so it seems like we might see more God of War or potentially Hogwarts legacies. Maybe it would be some kind of like smaller state of play event, or at least that's what I think they're getting across. But um, that's more or less what they were saying. And so uh, it might be a smaller event, like a state of play again, where it features, you know, two or three things. Um, and we still get a traditional September showcase, or perhaps the big major showcase is August. Uh, the thing is, you know, we can't really predict Sony anymore, right? Um, they do so many different things. You've got God of War launching on a Wednesday, right? Um, we have state of play announcements on Tuesdays, uh, but sometimes it's Mondays. Uh, they've had live streams on Wednesdays, Thursdays. I mean, there's certain patterns, but largely they kind of do whatever they want. And they've been doing this since uh, basically 2019, right around that time. And so uh, there's nothing telling us we have to get a PlayStation showcase in September because they've only done it twice now, right? That's not enough to, you know, completely verify that we're going to be getting nothing but a September showcase annually. So perhaps they'll they'll change it. They, they seem to be doing whatever they want nowadays and more so they're very secretive. So there is very few people that often have good info. And so at least uh, with this user where they were um, fairly accurate with the whole God of War situation. Uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, either way, we are fairly close to what should be some sort of a state of play or, or PlayStation showcase. Next up, we have a patent from Sony Interactive Entertainment that was published back in, uh, it was recent, so like June 23rd, I wanna say. And this patent caught a good amount of attention with some speculation based on the images in the patent where it shows uh, PlayStation 3 stuff and uh, legacy consoles converting legacy code into updated code. And so let's really break down what's going on in this patent. So the title of it says, and I quote here, uh, systems and methods for converting a legacy code into an updated code. And on the right side, it says, and I quote here, the method further includes compiling the one or more blocks of code from the one or more instructions of the legacy game code, caching the one or more blocks of code, and executing the one or more blocks of code to display a virtual environment. And then inside the patent are various reference images describing legacy hardware and different ways that legacy software is played. So there's direct mentions of PS1 and PS2 and those consoles' basic architectures. There's also PS3, 4, and PC shown in a relationship breakdown where they're in a, a data center. And then there's the network in between. And finally, the client, which would be a customer streaming a game. The illustration that was reported online though is this one, and this goes directly back to that video I did debunking PS3 emulation, if you all remember that, when PS3 prices were on the PS Store, but that was simply old PS now metadata, and I had mentioned that when it comes to patents, we would know right away if Sony is talking about PS3 because it's very hard to hide it. It's um, a very unique architecture, and this picture shows it. You've got the cell, the RSX, the IO bridge leading to the hard disk drive, the card readers for Compact Flash, SD, Memory Stick Pro Duo, the Blu-ray drive, and on the other side, more obviously, our range of PS3 accessories. So a controller, the remote, a generic keyboard and mouse, which PS3 accepts most via USB and Bluetooth. Uh, you've got PSP connectivity, the PlayStation Eye, and even the legacy card reader for PS1 and PS2 memory cards. But what does that all mean? So if you look at where these numbers are referenced, it says here, and I quote, the game console 1400 is an example of the game console 402, back to figure 4A. The game console 1400 is located within the data center or is located at a location at which a player, such as user 1 or 2, is located. In some embodiments, the game console 1400 is used to execute a game that is displayed on a head-mounted display. So it's just describing a PlayStation 3 and, and how it's used, but this patent also describes data centers, uh, PS1's DMA, also GCN, that's an instruction set found in the APUs used in PS4. Basically, the patent is about a compiler converting legacy code and caching blocks of code as in that's that's specifically what this patent is about and it goes into detail on 
how it could be used. This doesn't rule out PS3 emulation as far as I can see, but there's also nothing in here saying that's what this is for. It could very well be continued emulation advancements that Sony has surely been doing for a long time anyway, so this isn't even something where we have to look at a patent history. You know, Sony's obviously got a history um, with emulation, and uh, most recently with their new efforts on PS1, uh, PS2, and PSP titles on uh, on the new PS Plus relaunch. But that could very well be, this could be for any PlayStation platform. It could be, it could also mean PS3 emulation is on the way, but maybe it's only for the data center that is then going to stream it. We still don't have a clear answer, but just to be, you know, transparent, this is another situation where I think people are just looking at pictures and just kind of running wild with the hopes and dreams that will have the, uh, what we all want, which is your PS5 will take a Blu-ray disc and play a PlayStation 3 game locally. I, that's not what's being described here, although in fairness, it's not being ruled out entirely. But as I sort of talked about in that PS3 debunking video, Sony can't really hide PS3 when it comes to, you know, patent language because it's so unique. And so, yeah, it's in here in plain sight, but they don't really describe um, emulating it specifically. They're just talking about a particular method that broadly encompasses uh, various legacy hardware and software, if that makes sense. Now, not to burst uh, more bubbles here, and I, I still think this is good news, but uh, somebody on Reset Era spotted a job listing for a software development engineer at PlayStation where the job listing says, and I quote here, our software development engineer position works on the tools and technology team at PlayStation Studios to support the newly relaunched classics for PS4 and PS5. Classic games run via emulation of legacy PlayStation platforms. As a classics engineer, you would work closely with a group of other engineers, producers, and QA teams to fix bugs, add new features, and develop new emulators. So that's good to see, but we didn't need this job listing to tell us this. We already have the new PS Plus on PS4 and PS5 with new PS1 games. We see the new emulator. We see the new features, so there's nothing new here. We know they have this team doing this, but uh, it's still nice to have this renewed focus and uh, them really you know, reinvesting in the space of bringing back classic games, treating them with respect. I've always said Sony has every opportunity in the book to nip away this narrative that they don't care about their old games. They have the lineage, the history, the quality software. Um, if they treat these games with respect, bring them forward, they can easily wipe away that narrative. And, and it seems like they're slowly getting there. But in terms of what people are, you know, again, looking for here, PlayStation 3, uh, this job listing also might infer that's not really the case because under the uh, nice to have section, it does say MIPS uh, assembly experience. The MIPS instruction set is only on PS1, 2, and PSP. So once again, nothing in here calling out PS3 specifically, but... Um, you know, again, we did have a rumor from Jeff Grubb uh, somewhat recently about how Sony is uh, allegedly looking into it finally or they're starting it. But uh, that's always the big question mark. I mean, I have no doubt that Sony's, you know, looked into it. It's always a question of, you know, how far along are they? Is there progress? Are they really, you know, considering it? Because it would take considerable effort to really get it working in a big way where it reliably hits a good portion of the PlayStation 3 library. That's always the big problem is that it's just, a, it's a... It's a massive undertaking that financially might not make sense. Uh, and there's still the question of, you know, some believe that PS5's CPU still doesn't really have the headroom required for emulating the cell processor. I've always felt that, you know, if anybody can emulate PS3 on PS5 today, it would be Sony because they have source code and they know the PS3 better than anybody. Um, and I know the suggestion always is, you know, how about reaching out to our PCS3? But the problem with that is that there's a conflict of interest there. So if you bring in some of that team from our PCS3, they can never go back because they're going to sign an NDA once they are under Sony and they've seen source code or whatever. Um, that also puts our PCS3's uh, future into question if a lot of that team is taken away. So there's just, that's kind of messy. Um, they would really have to start, you know, from scratch on PlayStation 3 uh, to emulate that system. But I digress. The point is, Sony is taking classics more seriously. And that's good news all around, even if we don't get PS3 for the time being. 
Moving on to Sucker Punch, where they recently outlined what's going on with Sly Cooper and Infamous. And uh, this was part of a blog post on their site where they talked about Infamous 2's uh, user-generated content, how they're going to try and support that for as long as they can. That's nice. Also, some uh, DLC for Infamous Second Son that they're going to try and make available for everybody. And uh, at least for those legacy IP, they did say, and I quote here, with our plans on our current project, we have no plans to revisit Infamous or Sly Cooper right now, and no other studio is currently working on projects related to those franchises either. These characters are very special and near and dear to our hearts, so while we'd never say never to reopening those doors down the road, for now there are no Infamous or Sly Cooper games in development. So there you have it. Um, disappointing, obviously. I would have really loved for a proper Sly Cooper on PlayStation 5. And uh, that was certainly a rumor that we were following for a bit where uh, that was from both account NGT and Special Nick of Xbox era. And even then where they've, you know, had one or two things correct in the past, uh, those accounts have also been, you know, throwing a lot of things at the wall. So it's not always, even when we're a little bit picky with what rumors we cover and speculate on, even then they sometimes don't pan out. But at the very least, uh, there's one good thing here, which is, uh, well, the, the transparency, right? I mean, I wish more studios would do this and there's no reason to think that they're, you know, lying or, you know, trying to be misleading here. And that always has been kind of the thing with, you know, certain uh, developers and publishers because if they want to announce something on their terms, then they will, you know, directly lie to the consumer. It's certainly happened. It's just nowadays that's not really the case. Uh, more, more often than not, we're seeing studios be, you know, very cut and dry about what's going on at the studio. This is happening. This is not happening. This IP is dormant. Maybe we'll, we'll look back on it. Um, you know, projects nowadays are getting announced three, four, five years in advance because they're just fielding out talent for these projects too, right? Just there is secrecy, but then there's also not secrecy if that makes sense. So um, I would just take their word for it. We're not getting infamous or Sly Cooper, at least not anytime soon, which does suck, but um, you know, maybe someday. Now moving on to more legacy and PS3 related news. We've got a lot of it this week and uh, this one is also <laughs> not good news. Uh, it actually directly affects uh, the video that we do on this channel every year, which is you know checking out some PS3 games online. Ubisoft recently confirmed as of September 1st, a lot of seventh generation games are going offline and for PS3, the titles affected are Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, Revelations, uh, Driver San Francisco, Ghost Recon, Future Soldier, Rayman Legends, and Splinter Cell Blacklist. So those games will have their online functionality shut down come September 1st. Um, more and more games are unsurprisingly going down, but uh, we also have some games going back up as well. So that's uh, good news, at least in terms of private servers. But um, <clears throat> yeah, this was inevitable. And so if you're still actively playing and checking out PS3 stuff, you might want to um, get these titles, uh, get your game time in on these games before, they, uh, before they're shut down. Let's move on to media events. Uh, unsurprisingly for Tokyo Game Show, Sony is not a major exhibitor this year, um, which they haven't been for a while because you know, even prior to COVID, they said they were going to, you know, skip a lot of these major trade shows and instead do, uh, well, at the time they said 100 uh, plus, you know, smaller focused live events, uh, consumer focused and retail events, which that directly goes against what happened during COVID. But um, that was one reason why they weren't doing, you know, traditional trade shows anymore. But um, they won't be a major exhibitor at TGS, but they will be um, there in some way in terms of presenting some smaller indie games. So perhaps there's something that they're publishing or just representing uh, at the show. So um, that's something to keep in mind. But um, E3 2023 is coming back confirmed for now. So we'll see how long that uh, holds up. But E3 this time around, the ESA is partnering with uh, Repop, which they represent uh, a few different organizations, like for example, uh, GamesIndustry.biz, uh, VGC, they've got a lot of those uh, companies under their belt, and so they're going to help bring E3 back in a big way. Um, and they mentioned that they'll have, you know, major AAA reveals and exclusive access to, you know, future video games and earth-shaking world premieres and uh, featuring in-person consumer components. And they're obviously, you know, putting out a laundry list of what they want to do for E3 2023 and Jeff Keighley has still outlined that the Summer Game Fest 
2023 will be a live in-person event and they have their own things going on that um, now they have to compete with another E3 coming back and E3 still is just not ever going to be what it once was especially without you know sony or nintendo going anymore as uh, major exhibitors that buy up a ton of floor space it's just the e3 that we had before is never coming back because it's not really a trade show anymore trade just does not happen there anymore uh major deals can still take place but um gdc has largely been filling that hole lately uh also gamescom it's just uh e3 it'll be interesting to see what this upcoming year looks like if it follows through i mean this is the same organizer that handles things like packs basically so um it certainly could be a fun more consumer focused event but um the old e3 is definitely done so but i'll stay optimistic and uh, perhaps 2023 will be um will still be exciting in its own unique way now with all that said it is time for let's talk plus the weekly let's talk playstation giveaway where one of you can win a ten dollar psn code i would like to congratulate this viewer right here i'll be contacting you very soon via email or twitter and if you would like to win a ten dollar psn code it's very easy you can follow the link down below supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry and i'll announce the winner next week because i'm trying to help pay for your games those are all the stories that i wanted to talk about you all from this past week and our Tuesday video was reviewing the PS3 launch lineup with my best friend Terrell, which you may remember I had him on like three something years ago and I finally got him back on for something else where uh, we played every PS3 launch title in North America um, and gave them a quick little review and uh, hopefully based on the positive reception I'll get him back on sooner rather than later but until then uh, another upload on Tuesday as usual but uh, that's it that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation I'm Ryan Benecki thank you all so much for talking with me and I will see you all next Friday.